Welcome to Audiorama Onda Lectora. Make yourself comfortable, listen, and enjoy this audiobook. Unlocking the Power Within Thoughts Are Things by Prentice Mulford. Each thought is a brick with which we build our destiny, for better or for worse. Thoughts shape our face and give it its personal expression. Our thoughts determine the behavior, presence, and shape of our whole body. The laws of perfect beauty and perfect health are identical. Both depend entirely on the state of mind or, in other words, on the coherence of the main thoughts, which we transmit to others, and which others transmit to us. Today, the enormous power of thoughts, is not only wasted, but worse, due to ignorance and habits ingrained over the years, we discharge our batteries in the wrong direction. We endlessly accumulate greed, envy, mockery and other vileness, and then we discharge them, passing all the real substance of thoughts through lousy transformers, on other people, perhaps harming them, but always harming ourselves. The thoughts of other people can penetrate into our being, in the same way that noxious gases, can penetrate into our houses. Repeat these words endlessly, I do not want to be enslaved by anyone, and you will find the way to free yourself from slavery, dependence and begging. Depending on the fabric of which our reveries are made, we will endow our destiny with gold, or with explosives. The deeper the reveries, the more perfect the introspection and abstraction, the better our mental force will be able to act, within a radius of action of thousands of kilometers. Everything we call occult forces, for example telepathy, is generated in this way. Any form of thought can materialize instantaneously, if it is done with sufficient intensity. All people potentially have these forces at their disposal. Every day we stylize a phase of our being, we put ourselves into another imaginary character. The main role we play most often will give our body, the mask of that role, its dominant aspect. He who spends most of his life complaining out of habit, holding orgies of ill-humor and lamentation, intoxicates his blood, ruins the features and complexion of his face. For in the invisible laboratory of your spirit, an evil agent is being elaborated, the thought, once passed into action, that is to say, once thought, will generate an inevitable law, which will attract to it the same thoughts that surround it. To surrender to an irritated and impotent state of mind, means to open the doors, to the thoughts of all the irritated and impotent of the city, that is to say, to load your great magnet, the spirit, with noxious and destructive currents, and to connect your mental battery to all the currents of the same kind. Whoever thinks of stealing and murdering, comes into spiritual contact with all the thieves and murderers of the whole world. We all end up as we are accustomed to see ourselves, and we should not allow others to mold us according to their thoughts, that is, in the way that is most comfortable for them. Hence the ideal of the good child or the exemplary wife. What is truly feminine will only be known when women have begun to be themselves. When this happens, the world will suddenly be psychically twice as rich as at present, in which man, pursuing exclusively his own ideal of masculinity, has decreed a forced ideal of femininity. People who are always cautious, who foresee and weigh everything, always fall into the trap, because always counting on difficulties means creating them. A habit so ingrained that it seems impossible to exterminate. Everything you think, attracts the same from the invisible. Meditate inwardly on any kind of crime, and you will attract to you criminal realities, from the hidden side of life. Those hidden, invisible forces are what create the material conditions for crime, paving the way to this side of existence. If in your favorite newspaper, every morning you avidly read the news about murders, robberies, scandals and tragedies occurring on land, sea and air, you are attracting something invisible of the same kind. You tune into spiritual events of a lower order, which pass through you, and act on you in such a way, that you will be more exposed to them, even physically, that is, you increase the chances of being touched, by something coming from this region of shocks, especially if for years you do it while eating, breakfast, that is, during a state of absorbed passivity. Perhaps deep down it is not so old-fashioned, 
as the white barbarian thinks, that the esoteric, childish, people of the East prefer to greet the morning with a hymn to the sun, or with the mantra, O Mani Padmi Hum, rather than reading the, Diary of the Goradas. Everything is reality flowing in the invisible, and whoever in the spirit is immersed in those currents of the lowest, frightful, and meanest, and even if only as an interested listener, who merely listens with a bit of exciting morbidness, and mistakenly believes to be, far from the battlefield, ends up being swept away by them. But the circuit has already been closed, letting pass the current that carries evil and crime. Whoever enjoys reading news about robberies, burglaries and thefts, runs a greater risk of attracting more of the same, to himself and to his home. This person and the thief, end up attracted to each other, because both swim in the same river of thoughts, without being aware of the power that unites them. But no power is as irresistible as the one whose existence we are not aware of, because we are not in a position to resist it. He who for ten seconds imagines something abominable and terrible, something that would make another person despair in body and soul, has already set in motion a force, which in part will fall upon himself. He who for ten seconds imagines something pleasant and loving, something that would bring joy to another person, without sting or shadow, has set in motion a force, which will also partly fall upon him. The longer the senses are oriented towards an object, for better or for worse, the more its invisible reality is reinforced. In the end it will be forced, always fed by a new substance of thoughts, to mature as an agent of joy, or as an agent of pain in the visible world, which is nothing but the densest level of the invisible world. To orient the spirit towards a goal, willingly and without hesitation, to create a desirable and joyful atmosphere for an indefinite time, is something that is not very fashionable at the moment. What are the people around us thinking about? Well, about getting paid, about the quality of the beer, maybe about going on a trip. Women, always on the lookout, with the new fashion magazine, the dressmaker, the bridge game, or the trip they are going to take in the summer. Always ahead with a, faute de mieux, lurking with a diffuse undertone of eroticism, never with enough strength to face life, just entertaining it, with countless mornings and afternoons, which they could and should wring its neck, slowly, one after the other. The state of mind in which we find ourselves, is often a force capable of orchestrating events in our favor, or against us. For example, there are beings who are born with soul, but without impetus, without goal or path, who are not able to take care of themselves, or to preserve what they have inherited. They are academic examples of a way of thinking that generates failures. Others, however, born in poverty, are able to accumulate well-being from the beginning. They direct all their thinking and will towards one goal and succeed, if making money in itself can be considered a success. The promotion of any enterprise begins with fantasy. Those who, starting from a humble position, become proprietors of twelve railway companies, are always spiritually ahead of their location, that is to say, as soon as they reach one position, they are already longing for the next. Whoever endures for years as a rag picker, has evidently never seen himself in any other situation, that is to say, he has never psychically surpassed the rag picker's frontier. He may envy others who are in a better position than himself, wishing to have many of the things they possess, but he has never said to his own soul, I want to free myself from this trade, and I shall succeed in it, I shall rise to something purer and higher, than rag picking. But mere envy does not help to advance, and that man will remain a rag picker all his life. He who is, content, to look upon the finer things of this world as unattainable, who sits on the first rung of the ladder, complaining of all those above him, will probably always remain at this level. Any spiritual posture, in which we remain inert for a certain period of time, directs us towards things in life that encourage this posture. Whoever has decided to have a business or an enterprise, or to develop an invention, mold something out of invisible elements, which are nevertheless as real, as any iron or wooden machine. In turn, that enterprise, or that plan, will attract more forces favorable to its realization, forces that will materialize in the visible world. 
But he who fears misfortune, who lives in fear of meeting at any moment, with something bad or with an accident, is building a world of thoughts, attracting a silent force, which according to the law of attraction gathers around it harmful and destructive elements. Both success and failure have their origin in the same law, which can benefit both the one who tries to save someone who is drowning, as well as the one who stabs the same person. Every time we think, we manufacture something, from invisible ingredients, which contains forces that can benefit or harm us, depending on the thoughts we have previously transmitted. The cornerstone of every successful endeavor, in this, and in any other existence is, never to think that something is impossible. Never refute a priori any idea, no matter how crazy or far-fetched it may seem. Wait first until your instincts have gathered, because they are not always there when you need them. Only then, perhaps, will appear that fine dew of dawn, of which only those who are sitting in the waiting room for what is to come will participate. But this most great and most pure miracle, even if it were visible to the whole world, would not last more than the blink of an eye, for it would pass immediately and without hindrance, to the brain of mankind. The more far-fetched and fantastic a thought is, the more time must be allowed for it to act. To shout, impossible, just because something seems impossible to us, means to engender that bad habit of despising things on principle. Consciousness behaves like a prison full of doors, which do not let in the infinite, and both inside and outside this prison, there remains only an insignificant and lonely human being. The power of the state of mind. Whatever happens to us, the cause is always a state of mind, rehearsed for a long time. Whoever silently and without hesitation, harbors in his heart a lively desire to succeed, without hesitation, drinks from the invisible river, as many auxiliary forces for his spiritual scheme, as the embryo drinks from the mother's blood, according to the established plan and unconsciously, unerringly absorbing all the elements he will need, for each of the stages of its development. For the blessed one, the whole cosmos is like a placenta that nourishes his actions. By, auxiliary forces, we mean above all, the ever-growing spiritual fecundity, the discovery of new ways and means. That is why we use the form to see, things, do, by themselves, language has known this for a long time and, grammatically, we all use this great creative word se, to perfection, but unfortunately we fail to put it into practice. Deep down, however, auxiliary forces, means, that we will always run into the right people, to carry out our plans. Never waste your energy searching for these auxiliary forces and their helpers with your bodily senses. Let your unconscious take care of that. You only have to make the right environment available to you. For example, a pregnant woman, let the embryo grow in the most natural way possible, and according to her own inherited secret laws, which in the end will make it possible for the new being to see the light. The mother has nothing else to do but to have good hope. The spirit behaves in the same way during the gestation of a plan. It thinks incessantly, I am determined, go ahead, it does nothing but think, not only with the brain and the heart, but with every movement, every cell. This will eventually generate a force, which will transport any idea into reality, as surely as a crane lifts its load. The forces that are born with the spirit in the invisible, continue to act even when the body is unconscious, to his beloved will give God in sleep, awaken and glimpse all the open roads, and a lot of new plans and methods, converge towards the beloved goal. It is precisely these new plans, which will set the body in motion, for then you will not be able to stand still, and you will see beforehand how everything is fulfilled. Now the time has come to act with due speed and certainty. But it can also happen that before reaching the maturity to act, one is already so exhausted from searching for opportune occasions that one lacks the necessary freshness to assimilate the liberating idea when it really appears. All business success is based on the continuous flow of new plans, thoughts, combinations and occurrences. All those thoughts and talk about misery, calamities and crimes undermine the ability to attract good things. It is a method of stealing money from one's wallet, 
and health from one's body. When one surrounds oneself with great and healthy things, well-being can grow almost limitlessly, and even if not in reality, at least in fantasy, towards a world full of animals, forests, and young and free seas. Whoever is not lucky enough to have dogs, deer, and birds as living friends, let him at least dream of them. Whoever feels oppressed and weak and cannot leave the city, let him throw himself with his spirit into storms and tides, or visit a circus, and enjoy in the flesh, what beautiful horses, agile acrobats and clowns are capable of. And observe how in this atmosphere of psychic diversity, the worries of the audience are unconsciously erased from their faces. What we call here the driving force of the mood, is not the longing for material objects, because longing is always accompanied by impatience and suffering, and impatience takes away what is desired or, at least, delays its arrival. When you think, right now and here I want it. I'm tired of this eternal waiting. Now or never, you are on the wrong track. You waste your strength in quarrels and arguments, because the desired thing has not come to you, and you do not concentrate your strength on the desire itself, where it has to act, but on the non-existence of the desired thing, thus reinforcing its non-existence. Never go too far in desire, do not let a desire break your heart. It would be like if someone, angry, wrecked his car because he got stuck in the mud, it is better to use force to get the car out of the mire. However, who has managed to avoid destroying the cradle of his longing, must be careful not to make another mistake, however understandable it may seem, to see himself in the long-for situation in a superficial way, as if he had already reached the desired goal, as if it were an image, and even an idealized image, of himself. Let us imagine someone, who wishes to own a very nice and special house, to live in it with a loved one, it will not help him to imagine his life in this house as if it were a movie. He must not see it from the outside, as if he were looking in a mirror, he has to be inside, inside the desired eye, otherwise he will only be his own spectator. Expressed in words, the authentic, inner strength of the spirit, it would be something like, may my pure and joyful self, be complemented also by all these things. I need to have such a house around me, such a loved one, and I will get it, provided there is a will, wiser than mine, that has decided that all this will be for my good. It has to be a state that comes from the heart, totally positive and at the same time sweet, sunny and determined. Never accompanied by doubt, irritation or impatience. To maintain this right state of mind, it is neither necessary nor advisable to have always in mind what is desired. The only thing capable of attracting success, beauty and joy, is our usual state of mind, and not the continual thinking about the thing we desire. If you are able to anchor this state of mind in your heart, and say to yourself calmly and inwardly, I will travel. I will see the most beautiful tropical countries, then you will be able to quietly forget that desire for a while, entertain yourself with other things, and prepare your desires in other fields, without delaying at all, the force that will lead you to make that trip. Whenever that desire to know exotic countries comes back to you, you just have to integrate it again, in the spirit of your unbreakable will to achieve it. There is nothing that influences more, in the success or failure of any desire, than our predominant state of mind, more than work, intelligence, sharpness or application. Each spirit is a sum of psychic substance, collected in the infinite abyss of time, built up from the experiences and memories of innumerable bodies. This psychic substance acts like a magnet. It has the ability to attract thoughts and to re-emit them and, like a magnet, to increase its strength through work. Just as any piece of iron can be magnetized by contact, any person, even the untalented, can attract spiritual forces to it, and thus become spiritually creative. The currents to which the person opens himself will determine the quality of his spiritual charge. If the person emanates decisiveness, hope, joy, strength, fortitude, justice, patience, order and precision, he will eventually attract more of these elements of thought, present in the environment, than the elements that are already part of that person's field of success.
A magnetic whirlwind is created, which will carry forces of the same sign faster and faster towards the center, because the elements themselves are now in space, and attract other like-minded elements, to bodies we will encounter in the future, whose function is to foster, or destroy, us. It is these elements, with which our fluids have already mixed long before, when they were still far from the body. What is the meaning of life? No one can evaluate the meaning of his own life, which is determined by a higher universal destiny, a law that dominates and guides us. Towards what? Towards an ever greater and unlimited capacity to be happy. Every day and every hour we advance towards happiness, with more and more sensitive, wiser and clearer organs, however much the appearances may seem otherwise. The pains we suffer come from the very growth of the spirit, which every day presses us more strongly, against the causes of our misery, so that we immediately perceive and accept that pain, as proof that we are on the wrong path, and that we must get out of it, whatever it takes. To the one who takes it seriously, to the one who from the depths of his being seeks the right path, something will always appear to guide him, because one of the most subtle and profound laws, postulates that, no authentic supplication can remain unanswered. Every desire and every intense and authentic prayer, must give the desired fruits. People who seem to be persecuted by errors may be the kindest and the best, but they are people who speak to their own being with hardness. They do not realize where fate wants to take them. Like a horse that trembling under the rod, is unable to jump over an obstacle. Where there is suffering, there is error, where there is pain, there is always something wrong. Pain is the compass that guides us to the islands of the blessed. In the small circle of the wise, there are some who live so harmoniously with the infinite, that the line of their respective destinies, no longer recognizes the suffering of tortuous paths. But these few sages, knowingly, retain a small defect, a weak point of their psyche, to have an earthly compass, capable of measuring the smallest deviations from the truth, whose needle reacts to the slightest error, with the body. Each desire, thought or expressed, brings us closer to the desired with an intensity directly proportional to the intensity of the desire and the number of people who share it. These people, direct the spiritual functions toward certain orbits, setting in motion each of the silent forces of the will, which will help you to shape the desire. The secret of the magic, resides in the capacity of the human being, to use in its advantage, the most subtle and intense mental waves. Happiness and health are intertwined with the fibers of being. We must see our own image, freed from all evil, week after week, month after month and year after year, until this dream becomes a fixed idea, a second nature, so that it can continue to act in the subconscious. Never expect sickness or pain for tomorrow, however much sickness or pain you may have today. For tomorrow expect only health and strength. In other words, health, beauty and strength should become your dream of the day, because a dream expresses the right state of mind much more clearly than hope. The Evil of Unconscious Tyranny Faith is the seed of all miracles. But in this seed can germinate both evil and good. From the seed of evil can grow a tree, in the top of which, every noisy bird of ill omen will nest. Our dark and gloomy fantasy has faith in misfortunes. When one of our organs causes us a slight discomfort, after a day or two, we already begin to expect that discomfort, and we begin to imagine that the organ is sick. Then we hear that the ailment has a pompous name, and that it sounds dangerous. All this intensifies the belief in misfortune. Then the influence of other brains appears, friends and relatives get worried and frightened, thus reminding us of our condition. With all this, we fall into a vicious circle, which weakens us even more. No one transmits to us his own image of strength and well-being, the imagination of being sick comes to us from everywhere. The spiritual forces of everything around us act in the wrong direction. When a friend says goodbye with a, get well. He does so with a compassionate concerned tone, which seems to portend the worst. Now we receive the substance of what we feared. 
relatives who care for us do nothing but further our ruin. People with whom we only have professional or business ties are of little importance. But we must be careful with whom we share our most intimate moments when we let ourselves go, when we are in a passive state. Whoever shares those moments with a person, whether male or female, who is not up to his level, will lose much spiritual strength in the things he undertakes, because that person, inferior, will divert his line of action or, at the very least, will influence it. Therefore, much will depend on the person with whom we share our intimacy. These people have elements which for us can mean life or death, courage or cowardice, security or insecurity. A sum of unconscious tyranny emanates from the bonds of kinship. Often, adult children inwardly assign to their fathers and mothers places in life that these are not willing to occupy. The essence of this thought never openly expressed could be formulated as follows, our mother is too old to wear such light colors. It would be ridiculous for our widowed mother to remarry, or, it is logical that our mother does not want to participate in our parties. Mom doesn't want to participate in our parties, it's better if she stays at home taking care of the children. Or, it's time for dad to retire from the business. When it comes to obtaining results, no mental force acts with such subtlety, none is so powerful, for better or worse, than that stream of homogenized thoughts that, emanating simultaneously from several people, is concentrated until it produces, the desired effects on a given person, either consciously or unconsciously. The force acts and produces a result. If the same opinions of three or four persons, are directed towards the being who has given them new bodies, whom they call, mother, the force of those opinions will be powerful enough, to place the mother, precisely, in the most comfortable place for the children. So this whole process of conventional thinking, could be expressed as follows, mom is getting older, and it is natural for her to gradually withdraw from active life, and stay at home, so that there she can enjoy herself with the other retired relatives, and assert herself as superior, in times of illness or during family events. Thanks to the effect of this unified feeling that surrounds them, many mothers lose their privileges as individuals, and behave exactly as their children want, unconsciously, to behave. There are mothers who say, I don't care what happens to me, as long as my children grow up healthy, then I will have accomplished my mission. However, a mother must keep in mind what will become of her. Because if her growth in wisdom and culture is limited, the growth of her children will also be limited. A good mother will always do her best, so that her children admire her as much as they love her, but admiration and respect are reserved for those women who defend their place in life with fortitude, strength and freedom, and who grow tirelessly towards ever new goals. No mother can expect too much love and respect, from adult children who hide in a corner of the kitchen, who become a symbiosis between nurse and nanny, and who teach their family, to be used as pack animals for all domestic calamities, real or imagined. Precisely for the above reasons, many mothers, are belittled by their adult children or simply pushed aside. Mothers who demean themselves to such an extent, because they, mistakenly, believe they are doing their children a favor, often end up paying bitterly for that mistake. Whoever allows himself to be continually dictated to by others, who abandons his own inclinations and goals, who lives to satisfy the desires of others, gradually loses the right to make decisions for himself. He accumulates around him so many other people's thoughts, that he ends up becoming part of them, an instrument that obeys, in silence, the mute will of those around him. Such a person becomes a fossil, a helpless servant who gradually loses the physical and spiritual capacity to undertake anything, a senile grandfather, a useless old man sitting in front of the stove, who is more tolerated than loved. In many cases, this is due to the thoughts that adult children have, regarding their parents too, sacrificed. It is the mute power of the spirits, which in a closed environment act on fathers and mothers, and end up sinking them. Much of the deterioration and weakness attributed to old age, have their origin in the negative influence of a group of spirits, who continually try to overcome and dominate each other, 
consciously or unconsciously, it matters little. A man may lead his great enterprise with impetus and joy, but his male children, interfere more and more in the enterprise. A silent youthful force is conspiring against the old, creating a force, which can hardly be opposed by a single individual. It is an intense, continuous and permanent pressure in a certain direction. Its effects are even more effective when the father is not aware of the pressure exerted on him, when he is not aware of the existence of this kind of hidden force. The only thing he notices is that he begins to feel tired. The old energy gives way, and the man attributes it to the old age that plagues him. Spending ten minutes arguing with one's own destiny, or envying the happiness of others, generates in us a sum of forces, destined to undermine our own luck. Every thought of envy or hatred comes back to us like a boomerang. Unpleasant feelings towards people who swim in wealth are a waste of time, which not only bring us misfortune, but destroy and advance the happiness, which could have fallen into our lap. Most of the sick, prepare their sick bed spiritually, working hard and painfully for years to get it. Whoever expects misfortune is crying out for it, and will certainly get it. Bad habits accumulated during life must be nipped in the bud. The weakness generated by low self-esteem. A person with low self-esteem is not as appreciated by others as one who respects himself. Without self-esteem, no one will be willing to help you improve your position. There will be no bundle of thoughts to tuck you in. Many people who examine themselves come to the conclusion that there are positions in life that they would never accept. Nine out of ten women dishwashers would never think of seeing themselves as managers of the hotel chain of which they are now the most humble collaborators. However, sometimes a person in a similar precarious situation, is able to rise to a much higher position, because she dared to think about it. That was the invisible driving force, which led her to achieve it. If we are persevering, destiny will always take us where we want to be spiritually. And even if we do not get directly to the goal, at least we will get closer to it, reaching a position, which will be better than lying in the gutter, without goals or ambitions. Whoever thinks that something he offers to others is of little value, externalizes a force that makes others think that, indeed, it is something despicable. If you want to sell diamonds on the street, and your appearance and your behavior, make others doubt the authenticity of your diamonds, 99% of potential buyers will think, due to the suggestion of your thoughts, that you are trying to sell them pieces of polished glass. And the one buyer who has recognized that the diamonds are genuine will try to deceive you, thus supporting his own doubts. Do not bend, do not ever feel demeaned in the presence of anyone. Otherwise, you will pour into your state of mind, a torrent of enslaving dependence, and you will open the floodgate, which will let the same torrent pass before any unworthy event. You must admire and honor the talent of others, but always from king to king, with the pure and deep desire, that in you awaken and be born the same talent. Teach your children to never think that they are worthless. If they get used to not having self-esteem, others will also get used to seeing them as inferior beings, now as children and later as adults. There is nothing more harmful to the individual, than to lower himself, and many children, start their lives weakened by the burden of eternal criticism. Teach your children to dream, to believe and to hope that they will succeed. Because repeated hope in success creates the right motives, the right means, and the right path to achieve it. Because having to endure injustice, is even more reprehensible than committing it. Today, we all continue to believe in many lies. The error does not manifest itself. So we continue to live according to our subconscious errors, and sufferings emanate from these subconscious errors. When we discover hidden errors in ourselves, instead of getting depressed we should rejoice about it, just as the sailor rejoices when he finds the leak that could have sunk his ship. Once recognized, our mistakes are subjugated to self-confession. If we succeed, and if we also succeed in overcoming our foolish pride, which is responsible for our unwillingness to seek, escape, we will have taken a great step on the road to eternal happiness. 
repeatedly ruminating on our own mistakes is detrimental to the psyche and harmful to our health. The true nourishment of the spirit is our ever-renewing thoughts, our ever-changing and ever-growing interpretations of everything that happens within us and around us. Learning to look at things with new eyes every day, to fly daily over the plans, opinions and goals, which we had set for the day that ends, that is the state of mind, by which the spirit becomes capable of receiving the daily bread, which renews our body. Our favorite spoiled fear. The whole of humanity never ceases to be afraid, of pain, of death, of losing money or love, and of anything. In addition, each of us has our favorite fear, which we spoil to satiety. This extends to the most trivial things. The streets are full of people who, if they have nothing better to fear, at least fear missing the next bus or streetcar. The more sensitive the human being is, the more he suffers under those currents that surround him, until he learns, asking for strength in silence, to build around him a wall of positive thoughts, on which the alien worlds bounce. Every human being has his favorite fear, an illness he has never suffered from, but always hopes for, or anything else whose loss would affect him in a special way. Any little thing or casual word is enough for his favorite fear to appear immediately in his consciousness, which, after so many years of training, is exposed to the devastating storm. This current vibrates virtuously, precisely in the chord of our nature, which sounds our favorite weaknesses. Then, the body also suffers. There are myriads of different symptoms. Weakness, lack of appetite, fatigue of the limbs, inability to concentrate on our professional tasks, mental fugue, etc. The ability to receive thoughts, can easily become a source of weakness, or strength. It is precisely the sensitive and highly developed spirits, which usually have a fragile body, because they unconsciously absorb many harmful waves, without having any idea of their existence. Personal relationships with inappropriate people is one of the main sources of these evils. The female organism, thinner, is even more exposed to the shadows, and mental rays that surround it. The man, absorbed in his affairs, sometimes manages to seize a certain positive energy, which allows him to repel the currents of fear. The woman, on the other hand, usually suffers a thousand times more within the walls of the home, than their husbands imagine, who never cease to wonder how their wives suffer from these eternal diseases, fixed ideas and nervousness. When you are irritated you diminish your force of attraction towards the good. You also decrease it when you feel depressed, dependent, nervous or confused. Then, the force acts in the opposite direction, toward the bad side. Coveting the goods of another, for example, filling the brain with machinations about how to access an inheritance, feeding worries or even envy and hatred, towards those who might be in a better position for an inheritance, looking greedily at any other's good, for example, flattering the rich in the hope of making a profit, all encourage mental states, which prevent the creation of that great pulling force. They lead to the torrent of petty, villainous and narrow thoughts. Another great loss, is to be dragged by malicious prejudices against third parties, even if only by participating internally, in the nonsense of the majority. When you engage in conversations with people below your own level, you lose power, even if your supremacy gets some small victories. You also lose power when you destroy the character or problems of others, no matter how witty and joking you are. Because you generate and emit mental forces, which prevent you from taking a much stronger stance towards humanity, and thus achieving an emancipation that comes out of yourself, and which allows you to directly access the best of others, in direct contact, from core to core, leaving everything else below and behind you. Ignore, as much as possible, the thoughts of humanity, talk as little as possible about it and with it. Keep it at bay with a shield of goodwill, and fight every shadow of hatred, indignation and contempt, which to the present humanity could serve as a dark intermediary. As a messenger of all that envy, of that fanatical and concentrated malice against the finer man, whose mere presence he already perceives from afar.
If this finer man launches a line of hatred, he is lost, only an active wall of benevolence, can sufficiently protect his soul. If despite this the encounter is unavoidable, be positive from the beginning, that is, launch currents instead of absorbing them. Deny him inwardly access, to everything that comes from this environment. If you make his foolish concerns yours, your traction force will be reversed, for you will absorb his defects, and you will mix your confidence with his skepticism, mutilating your firmness with his hesitations. The human being who still knows when he lies, remains relatively authentic and fresh. In him, the lie is encapsulated in knowledge as trachina in the flesh. But the majority has the organism so infected by the lie, that it no longer manages to make this distinction. The nature of the lie, it is not only the false word uttered consciously, but the deception. Including self-deception. A lie, which in good faith we have integrated within us, blocks, like any other lie, the constructive elements of the truth. Many lies, which barely manage to stand, can often be saved with the fresh blood of a truth, just as breeds of rabbits, which from so much incest would be doomed to disappear, are mixed with the pure breed, to prevent them from becoming extinct definitively. But the worst lies are half-truths. For example, welcoming someone in our home, when in reality we want him to go to hell. When we smile without having the slightest desire to do so. Or when we pretend to care about someone's welfare, just because he has money, in the hope of getting some benefit. Or when we become members of a religion or association for snobbery, mercantilism or prestige. Or when from the tribune or the pulpit, we announce things in which we half believe. Or we say a half yes, when we mean a resounding no. All this, these meager samples taken from the jar of daily lies, which otherwise do not deserve more attention, generates an evil that affects even the body. It is like alcohol, it is not the sporadic excess, but the small and continuous doses of the poison that, unconsciously ingested daily, damage the organism without the intoxicated being aware of it. Once saturated, the body is no longer able to eliminate the poison, until it gets sick and finally succumbs. Because lies do not last. The fabric of which they are made has to deteriorate, so that the spirit can find the right instrument, with which to reach its goal. In a word, again a failed incarnation. What seems to us bad and decadent, is nothing other than the infinite consciousness, abandoning a position that has become untenable. The second major drawback of lying, is that it introduces us into the circle of all the other liars, whom, due to an inner kinship, we will be much more willing to believe, than an honest person. The shrewd businessman, from a certain sector, is often deceived by an equally shrewd businessman, from another sector, because he dislikes authentic and upright people. There is a silent antagonism, without the need to utter a word. The lies that we ourselves supply daily to the cosmos, in the form of words, breath, presence and life, are nothing compared to the lies, which we unconsciously believe to let them act, with the best faith in the world, on us and those around us. It is a psychic plague. Gray hair, wrinkles, any sign of collapse of the cells of the body, are the materialization of errors of this nature. They are a sign that erroneous ideas, have been temporarily installed in consciousness. The fact that today, someone has to ask the doctor what to eat, who knows as little about the subject as the patient, is an alienation of instincts, which in nature, only occurs in some degenerate predatory ants, which, unable to find food for themselves, are forced to let themselves be fed by slave ants. The doctor knows at most something about diseases, but nothing about health, if only because the latter is a scarce commodity. Throughout his life, the doctor has no contact with normal and healthy people. Hence the frightening statistics, about the amount of protein we need daily, invented by the brilliant Liebig, who experimented on a large number of German students, with huge beer bellies, miserable engines, which needed three times as much fuel. Because of this, dose of protein, determined from, inept samples, for more than 30 years were administered throughout Europe protein poisons, 
to completely normal people, especially children, thus spreading acute appendicitis, gout and other diseases of metabolism. He who recognizes an evil is already half cured. When a negative mood invades us, it is important to be aware, that an external negative current is passing through us, that we are in contact, with many other dark and taciturn spirits, who send each other their repulsive moods, increasing them to the unbearable. What we have to do is to pray, to pray, to ask for the necessary strength to get out of this current of negative thoughts. We must eliminate as soon as possible from our consciousness, everything that is unpleasant and incomplete, the negative properties of others, and all the ugly and unpleasant things that surround us. Otherwise, we will be left with the images of these thoughts, which will eventually materialize in their specific correlation. Whoever imagines a person, always at the moment when he commits a characteristic mistake, will probably end up committing the same mistake in the end. Everything must be externalized, just as the tongue demands. Let everyone get into the habit of transforming all his thoughts into words, for in this way, they become more physical, and can be eliminated by physical means. The word is the vehicle that carries away the ignoble of the soul. Whoever turns night into day, misses the most important appointments of the subconscious. Tranquility as an accumulator of forces. Throughout the kingdom of nature, periods of activity are followed by periods of absolute tranquility. The circulation of plants rests during the winter, and animals limit themselves to eating and sleeping. Even the earth rests, waiting for new seeds. If from time to time, the human being were able to surrender to this perfect passivity, the one who is able to absorb more of the hidden power of the sun, would shine in a spiritual and corporal rebirth. In him would awaken senses and forces, the existence of which even today many deny outright. Thanks to their quiet and interiorized life, the Orientals, the people of the East, have to some extent attained more power over these, new, senses than we have. Certainly, they do not possess the strength and dominion of the conqueror, India is subject to England. But in the end they end up conquering Western culture, so externalized. We are already prostrate at the feet of India, learning our first lesson, the alphabet of those laws and forces, which our sages do not know. What are these forces? Where do they come from? How have they developed? From the power of the silent spirits, harmoniously oriented towards a goal, for thousands of years. But we feed the superstition that we are incapable of doing anything without haste, nervousness and fatigue. Nature needs rest to undertake the work of regeneration. This law, which operates in the most primitive forms of life, is also valid for the higher forms. In the life of any person, there are periods during which all his forces and organs show a certain fatigue, a sign that we are undergoing some process of transformation. Nature puts us in dry dock. If we would only follow these laws, in a few weeks or months, we would come out of these periods regenerated in body and soul. For nature asks nothing of us but to keep quiet, while it carries out its regenerative work. Of people who are in the middle of life, we say that they have reached, or even surpassed, their maximum vitality and strength, and that thereafter, for natural reasons, they will wither and decay like leaves. According to spiritual law, this unshakable faith in aging will necessarily make us bold. This change at the peak of life only means that our body wants to regenerate itself, to be reborn. This recreation demands absolute tranquility, because our highly spiritual ego is working to make that change. During this time we should not overexert ourselves, as in early childhood. But as a rule, we deny nature this rest, forcing our exhausted organism to make efforts, for which it is not prepared during this period. While nature tries to give birth to us again to make us stronger, we do not allow it to do so, and we destroy ourselves. In most cases, the human being is not able to give himself the peace of mind he needs. He has to go to and fro, and work year after year to secure his existence. This does not change the result at all. Christ and Moses, 
and all the seers and magicians were, in tranquility, accumulating psychic force, which once concentrated in a sick person gave him new life. In the story of Martha and Mary, the latter chose the better part, because far from the household chores in silence she accumulated strength, which well directed, in a few seconds, achieved more than Martha with her daily hardships. Martha was killing herself working, while Mary was regenerating herself. The culture of tranquility increases with the presence of mind. The presence of mind is nothing more than the capacity to mobilize all the knowledge, the capacity to act, the firmness and the tact that we have at our disposal at any given moment. Its value resides in the simultaneous presence of all these properties, which in calm spirits are concentrated, and are not dispersed hunting a thousand different things at the same time. Whoever manages to conserve his strength and rest his spirit will have nerves of steel. He will emanate a fluid capable of easily taming the wildest horse. Courage is an insurmountable magnetic cloud. Its possibilities are limitless. We can make our bodies capable of resisting any material influence, we can make each of our organs ten times more resistant than they are now. Where there is a little haste, there is always a little fear. Whoever runs to catch the train, does so because he is afraid to stay, and that fear increases even more, the possibility of being, stood up. Who runs to a meeting or an appointment, does so because he fears the negative consequences of being late. It is surprising how much, pocket change, we spend daily on fears. Through unconscious training, these little psychoses, can flood a person's spirit, to such an extent, that he ends up fearing to lose something at any time and place, even when there is no risk of doing so. For example, run bitterly behind a streetcar, as if it were an irreplaceable thing, when behind or, in the worst case, three minutes later comes another. But the fear of having to wait three minutes, becomes a mountain, like the pillow in a fever dream, a frightening possibility. Simply out of habit, this catastrophic state of mind, will accompany that person during meals, walks, vacations, in short, in everything he undertakes, making it increasingly difficult for him to keep a clear head. The emotion on which all this mood, and this behavior is based, is none other than fear. Fear is nothing other than the inability to control the emergence of thoughts. Our impotent, I, spits it all out, as if it were a geyser of mud, staining our daily life and covering it with a grey crust. This totally unconscious training, leads our spirit to such a chronic state, that it reacts with panic to any trivial event, hatching disappointments where there are none. But whoever cultivates fears of any kind, builds a dead end through which, in the decisive moments of destiny, can only circulate the fright. Never let yourself be carried away by the desire to earn money. Accumulating wealth to the detriment of health is like cutting off your feet to buy a pair of boots. Everything we undertake can be done without haste, fatigue or robots. If you are tormented, it is a sign that something is wrong in your company. When the spirit and the body work harmoniously and playfully, the greatest force is generated, this force, properly trained for two hours, is able to achieve more than ten hours of rushing. In these quiet moments, parents should be exempt from all the demands of their adult children. The same goes for birds and other forest animals, only human mothers, are never sheltered from the demands of their young, until they reach the grave, exhausted and squeezed. But they should be free, they should go back to being as they were when they were maidens, before becoming mothers. Motherhood is an indispensable, and very important phase of human existence, so that certain capabilities and recognitions mature. We should not stagnate all our lives in a single experience. Help from the current of sympathy. A correct relationship between people, is the most powerful means to obtain happiness, health and success. In this context, by relationship, we mean something that goes far beyond physical closeness. The closeness of a person, depends on the intensity with which we treat him psychically, the physical distance of his body has no relevance. What else are social relationships, but a permanent, tolerate and be tolerated, 
illuminating the same words, gestures and thoughts, year after year. They are dead, which must be left to bury their own dead. Authentic and living life, is a state with infinite facets, an opening of spiritual currents, on which spirits of the same level, exchange their forces and ideas. These are the sources that ascend to the eternal being. Sympathy is the most important factor of all destiny. The mania for everything cheap flows parallel to fears and misfortunes, and never reaches the stream of enterprising spirits and victorious forces. Individuals who live in these currents never find themselves, whoever wants to approach the victors of life must change the direction of his spirituality. Only then will he be able to follow his path. People who gather together to pour their curses and envy on others, everything harmful will fall upon them with ten times greater force, because they will attract the same thoughts that they exude within themselves. The thoughts that are realized most frequently are also the ones that materialize most intensely in the organism. We absorb the errors and imperfections of others, because we are psychically occupied with them. In the scandal and gloating over the imperfections of others, there is some incense and ecstasy, something akin to champagne. But in the end this kind of fun comes at a high price. Sympathy is the strength. There is an active listening that acts as a tonic, and the benevolence of a single person, without vestiges of envy and derision, is an irresistible current, whose value cannot be calculated in dollars and cents. Similarly, wishing evil to another, is an element, which the person who silently perceives that desire against him, becomes a strong invisible wall, which returns it all without even a word or a glance. Only a continuous stream of kindness on your part, will be able to deflect this effect without consequences. That is also why it is so dangerous to make enemies, no matter how fair or logical the motive may seem. Every turbulent assembly, every family quarrel, every appearance between people, floods the invisible with destructive substance. And if any insignificant little thing manages to irritate you, without knowing it, you will place yourself there where this destructive substance acts, making any small outburst of your bad mood, wakes up the whole henhouse, from which it will be more difficult for you to get out, than it has been awakening you. The only possible help is for you to stop thinking about it, that is, to immediately change your spiritual direction, allowing yourself at best, a brief satisfied glance over your shoulder, at the pile of other people's anger that was about to pounce on you, and which has now stayed out, wet in the rain, thanks to your little private concession. There are poison spiritual currents, just as there are poison metallic vapors or toxic arsenic. Whoever remains a single hour in a passive state, in a room full of envious, hateful, cynical or enslaved people, absorbs from them an element of poison thoughts, full of disease and destructive force. An element infinitely more dangerous, than a toxic chemical agent, because its effects are more subtle and mysterious, as they often manifest days later, and are, erroneously, attributed to other causes. Probably never has been hated as much as today, hatred is not limited to castes and estates, it is not only hated vertically and horizontally, but also diagonally. The people's hate, patriotically, from party to party, and in between circulate, like small varicose veins in the body of humanity, the innumerable private hatreds from heart to heart. It is necessary to be especially passive during meals. Whoever ingests food, i.e., matter for the preservation of his body, should only do so in a calm, balanced and cheerful state of mind. Eating and complaining, arguing or doing business means being active, precisely when one should be in a state of absolute negativity. Whether these complaints or discussions, occur out loud or only in thoughts, is of no consequence. It is also harmful, when at the same table, sits a person who feeds this negative mood, against which one must defend oneself inwardly, but bear it outwardly, which requires a good deal of energy, is in itself positive. However, one should only share the table, with people who live in the purest sympathy. When all the people sharing a space, have joined together to transmit the same thought, the whole space, is filled or charged with this highly spiritual ether. 
If this thought is about power and help, something will prevail in the space, which, like a fluid, will be transmitted to the next person who enters this space, injecting it with strength and help. If hundreds or thousands of people, come to this sanatorium or sanctuary with the same spirit, each of them, will leave in it their grain of sand of strength and help. With time, this space will become a powerful accumulator of spirituality, as long as it is not used for other purposes, and access to other low, worldly, or selfish thoughts is prevented. The force accumulated in that space will help to heal those who have a sick body, and have come to him to ask with faith. The space will strengthen the weak-willed, straighten the depressed, as if a beam of invisible rays were supporting them. However, no one should remain in that place for more than a few minutes, lest fatigue or low thoughts accumulate there. We all have a vital need for a companion, with whom we can be natural. We need at least one person, with whom we can live our moods and feelings, before whom we can remove the mask, and we do not have to be always on guard. We need moments, in which we do not have to weigh our words, to say something intelligent and correct at all times, that is, having to keep our psychic arc tense, when it should be loosened. Sometimes we need to have the privilege and freedom, to be able to be trivial, to say nonsense, without fear of being laughed at, or looked at with long faces. The Art of Forgetting In every life, even in the happiest one, there are thousands of things, events and scenes, which it would be preferable to forget. Even the, happy memories, because even happiness becomes stale. Also the, level, of friends, should be able to grow every year, and tomorrow, should be more and more exciting than yesterday. Who forgets creates space for new thoughts and, consequently, for a new life. Who locks himself hermetically in the present or past happiness, even with it will end up old and grey. Forgetting, does not mean total annihilation, which otherwise would be impossible, since we are nothing but the sum of our experiences. Every scene, every smell, every word, and every kiss are organic components, integrated in our, even if in a diffuse, subway and invisible way, but always ready, by a series of mysterious associative laws, to reappear on the threshold of the door. However, it is advisable not to let certain groups of egoistic and maniacal memories pass through that door. A correct experience is one that we have forgotten. Whoever wishes to advance victoriously, in a straight line towards perfection, should not forget to balance beforehand, the load carried by his vehicle. There are people, who often recreate in the spirit ancient combats against their adversaries, and it is undeniable, that these old, spiritual combats in the field of blackbirds, always end well, that is to say, with the unconditional defeat of the imagined enemy. Here is woven a continuous story, infinitely rich in pleasant variants, culminating in a most delightful ending, with the dog trembling, tail curled up and defeated from head to foot, prostrate before our imposing summary of all his evil. Whoever believes that this has no further relevance, that it is only an innocent and cheap punishment, for those who went astray, is in a serious mistake, because this, game, is one of the greatest luxuries that a human being can afford, it costs lives. Whoever practices it enters into a cloud of cadaverous poison, hypnotizes himself in a fictitious life already decayed, sacrificing himself for an imaginary triumph in the past, and for a real triumph in the future. Whoever practices revenge is someone who acts in the name of the past, that is, with a 180 degrees misdirected energy. No one who feeds on outdated thoughts, the excrements of his outdated egos, can keep his body fresh and beautiful. The new influxes, the young future will be trapped by the sticky cells of the soul. The flesh, the bones, the marrow and blood, have become a rigid shell, a dead spirit. The weight of this crust, which grows unceasingly, leads us to a state of weakness and lamentation. Only he who manages to get rid of his worn-out shell, and move towards the new, with each young thought will succeed in rejuvenating his life, and those thoughts will also materialize, in the new body that corresponds to them. Being able to die every day, means that any past thoughts, already belong to the world of the dead. 
Spirits who grow healthy, at the end of each day, get rid forever of a part of themselves, they have simply lived to the fullest. To continue to use the thoughts of the past is harmful. The psychic substance must be expelled, in the same way, as the epidermis daily gets rid of countless cells, otherwise, breathing, circulation, nutrition and everything else of the skin would suffer. People who manage to continuously increase the renewal of their thoughts, in a single day, are able to experience entire worlds. For them, happiness practically does not depend, the place and circumstances in which they find themselves, they can attract it even being in prison, while those who are prisoners of their old ideas, rot living in a palace, it is a path to almost total independence from the physical, and independence is power. As long as we depend, to whatever extent, on another person, a food, a drug or a stimulant, we remain slaves. The only liberation from the prisons of material and spiritual misery is to have the capacity to create new thoughts permanently. But even the most lively, joyful and fertile ideas must temporarily disappear from our memory. For an enterprise, a study or a skill to be as successful as possible, it is necessary that every day, at a certain time, we forget completely about that enterprise, science or art that occupies us. For otherwise we will confuse the path with the objective, concentrating on the first, which should never happen. Because on that road, towards a greater and more lasting success, there may be a silent group of invisible helpers, who see beyond, and go one step and one action ahead of us, as by that mysterious road full of surprises, we are blind, and we have maniacally got into a dead end. Sometimes it seems to us that we are not moving forward, but the truth is that circumstances are only waiting for our knowledge to become clear enough. Whoever undertakes something, with a great and valuable goal, and after having done everything in his power, still encounters incomprehensible obstacles and setbacks, should immediately stop doing everything that goes beyond what is strictly necessary. It is better to insistently ask your spirit, to stop obsessing about the matter, and to rely exclusively on the mysterious and secret force, which is hidden behind all authentic things, to sleep and eat alone. And have fun. If he is conscious of having done everything in his power, let him switch off and stop doing nothing. The prevailing spirit and mood, shape the abdomen and limbs. They make us unpleasant or pleasant, attractive or repulsive to others and, most importantly, to ourselves. They shape our gestures, our gestures and our gait. The slightest tremor of a muscle, is due to a certain state of mind, or of thought. A spirit that possesses determination, always walks with determined steps, while insecure spirits, drag their feet and stagger. Determination stretches every muscle, and fills it with a wonderful and invigorating fluid, especially when this determination, is directed towards a profitable goal, not only for ourselves, but also for others. The selfishness that integrates in its works the welfare of others, is a wise selfishness, for in the spirit we all form a unity, in which other invigorating and vivifying currents flow, which foster what is good for many. In these invigorating and life-giving currents, coming from the invisible everywhere, also sails our little boat ego, towards its own realization. Towards its own realization. We are all members of one big body. Infinite invisible nerves run through space, from being to being. Each perverse thought is a pulsation that crosses myriads of beings. But in order to promote the fruitful processes of interconnection of thoughts between us and the other, they must be preserved in such a way that they are always fresh and chemically effective. And this can only be achieved with the art of forgetting, which is nothing more than the ability to correctly evacuate the consumed or decomposed substances. Learning to forget something is as important as learning to remember something. Old age often makes us see things as they were 50 years ago. Events and people always awaken in us the same associations of ideas. Therefore, the same story is repeated hundreds of times. Such a brain cannot feed itself with new ideas, because it tries to live in the past. Decadence and death are the consequences. Little by little, 
the spirit loses power over the organism. The memory and the senses begin to weaken, the limbs tremble, the flesh dries up, symptoms that the psyche, for lack of daily bread, that is, of new thoughts, is losing its dominion over the body. To really live, to increase with age our spiritual and bodily strength, to go through each phase of our existence, with an ever-increasing charm, to defeat our last great adversary, death, it is necessary to keep continuously in operation, the process of evacuation of old thoughts. Boredom is a disease, not knowing what to do with ourselves, sitting down to continuously re-inhale, the excrements of our thoughts, until from so much poisoning, everything seems consumed and flat. Trying to kill time is trying to kill life. Whoever succeeds, temporarily loses the connection with the great source, the contact with the infinite consciousness. This is the worst disease there is. Wait for success with peace of mind. Whoever is willing to take responsibility will succeed. Whoever is not willing to do so will be an underpaid pawn of the one who has the courage to take it on. Dare, even if only in fantasy, to run a large company and manage large sums of money. To dare in silence, in a small chamber of your spirit, will prevent anyone from making fun of you. To see yourself always at the bottom of the ladder is too cheap. Practice the art of waiting. Waiting for success with tranquility, is the most effective and fruitful method in the world, to invest the strength of your thoughts. Fearing misfortunes, foreseeing obstacles, obsessing over possible difficulties, is the surest way to ruin and poverty. Responsibility does not necessarily imply worry, anger, restlessness or irritability. The culture of the spirit, which teaches us not to worry about things that have not yet arrived, does not allow us to have thoughts about responsibility until such time as they are necessary or profitable. We should often talk about our big and important plans, but only with people who have similar interests and goals. These conversations should be repeated with some regularity, preferably at the same time, and in the same place, that is, not just anywhere, in a restaurant, in the street or on the train because they lose strength and reveal secrets, even when there is no eavesdropper nearby. As the proverb says, walls have ears. In crowded places, in any room that does not emanate psychic peace, there is always an agent, invisible, busy, thieving and cunning, ready to steal secrets to sell to a foreign brain. When a room is reserved exclusively for these intimate conversations, which should always be friendly and pleasant, and if this room is also used for this purpose for a long time, it will generate an atmosphere of advantageous thoughts, for the intended plans. This positive atmosphere will grow over time, so that in this room, ideas will appear more easily and quickly, than anywhere else. It will become a place of inspiration, open to the impulses of the spirit. However, if in such a room is discussed in anger, or if one of the people present is inwardly agitated, in this room, it generates a force harmful to all things in life, which acts in all directions. Knowing how to keep a secret, greatly increases its force of attraction. Walls have ears, for a long time. Your secrets escape through the ether, giving rise to rumors, even when there is no one around. If you really want to keep a secret, forget it, let it fade into your consciousness and remember it only when it is absolutely unavoidable. Don't play with it even in your thoughts. Because whatever you think, you execute it. You place it temporarily outside of you, in a substance accessible to everyone, from which it could gain access to a foreign brain, in the form of a presentiment or volatile suspicion, in which, thanks to your continuous repetition, it ends up maturing until it becomes there an absolute certainty. An example, there are people who insistently affirm, that two people have had sexual relations, long before these have taken place. Every great success has been, kept secret, otherwise it would have aroused envy, conscious or unconscious, which, once it has glimpsed the direction, deploys its forces to prevent it. Thousands of people have had their luck cut short, by, speaking openly, at an inopportune time or place. If you don't know how to proceed in a given situation, 
company, or business, just wait. Stop thinking about it. This will only strengthen your will and your goal. In this way, you will only collect and store, those forces that come from everywhere. They can come in the form of occurrence, inspiration, coincidence or opportunity. During this waiting you do not stop, but on the contrary, your aspirations will lead you mentally towards the occurrence, towards the opportunity you need. Appendix, Some Maxims of Prentice Mulford It will be given to you to the extent that you have given. Never teach your child to despise himself. If he gets used to feeling that way, others will also get used to despising him, first as a child and then as an adult. Teach your child only to dream and to expect success. The prolonged expectation of this success creates the conditions, the means, and the ways to achieve it. It matters little with whom we relate to at the professional or business level, but we must be cautious, before sharing our leisure hours, with certain people. The golden path of the middle, is usually through the sand. Relatives who care about us, often work for our ruin. Never expect sickness or pain for tomorrow, no matter how much sickness or pain you have suffered today. For tomorrow expect only strength. Look at things with a clear eye, and learn to overfly daily your plans, your beliefs and your goals of the previous day. Instead of getting depressed when we discover mistakes, hitherto hidden, we should rejoice in their causes, just as the sailor, rejoices to have found a waterway that otherwise would have sunk his ship. Much depends on the person, with whom we share our leisure hours, because from it come elements, which can mean life or death, courage or cowardice, lucidity or impotence. The person with low self-esteem, will not be judged by others, as it would be if he had more self-esteem. In the best of cases, the doctor understands something of disease, but nothing of health, because he hardly has contact with normal and healthy people. Every thought is a brick in our nascent destiny, for better and for worse. No one should tolerate, that other people mold him with his thoughts, that is to say, in the way that these seem to them more comfortable. Prudent people, who evaluate and reflect on everything, always fall into the trap, because always counting on difficulties means creating them. In order to promote any business, you have to start with imagination. To say that something is impossible because it seems impossible, means to cultivate the disastrous habit of rejection. Big and important plans should be discussed, but only with people who have similar goals and interests. Concentrating on one goal is a very wise form of selfishness. Determination tenses every muscle, and fills it wonderfully with a life-giving fluid. No one who feeds on obsolete thoughts, will manage to keep his body fresh and beautiful. Fear is but another name for the inability to control the emergence of new thoughts. Only people who live in the purest sympathy, are worthy to share the table. Courage is like a magnetic cloud, which nothing can pass through. Sixty seconds of reverie are sixty seconds of living peace for body and soul. But I had good times, and I intend to have even better times. The ties of kinship are a sum of unconscious tyrannies. People who travel a lot and continually see new places and people, are characterized by a certain degree of vitality, which do not have people who year after year, live in the same place. Contemplative life is creative, don't be afraid to entertain yourself. Heaven on earth is created by adopting the right attitude to the trifles of everyday life. It is healthy to surround yourself with colorful objects. What pleases the eyes refreshes the mind, and what refreshes the mind refreshes the body. When you think bright things, you will attract bright things to you. Every thought of envy or hatred will come back to you like a boomerang. Thank you for embarking on this enlightening journey with us through Prentice Mulford's Thoughts Are Things. May the wisdom shared in this audiobook inspire you to embrace the incredible power of your thoughts and manifest the life of your dreams. Remember, your thoughts shape your reality, so dare to dream big and believe in the magic within you. 
wishing you abundance, joy, and fulfillment on your continued journey of self-discovery. Farewell, and may your path be illuminated with positivity and possibility.